Good day, everyone, on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. My goodness, summer is going quickly, isn't it? Um, but we do still have the entire month of August. Don't forget that. We have plenty of time to enjoy both the sun and lots of harvest from the fields and from the gardens. Well, in today's gospel, um, Jesus is telling just one of his parables relating to a rich man. And in this case, it has something to do with barns being too full. I hope you'll enjoy hearing what he has to say. Until next week, I wish you God's blessings and good health. You take care. In God's reign, the rich will be sent away empty. Jesus uses a parable to warn against identifying the worth of one's life with the value of one's possessions rather than one's relationship with God. Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I know I will do this. I will pull down my barns and big lar build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Danny Cox wrote a book called Seize the Day, and in it he writes that he and his wife had traveled to Africa, and early one morning, they went on a tour, and they went up into a hot air balloon. I mean, can you imagine that in Africa? And as the balloon rose gracefully, in the distance, they, heard, they saw a herd of wildebeest who happened to be running like crazy across the open land below. Uh, just so you know, wildebeest, they're a type of antelope. I had to look that up. Well, then the herd just stopped suddenly and they started looking around as if they were confused and so Danny asked the pilot what had happened and the pilot said well you know wildebeest have this reputation of being bad learners kind of like sheep uh, they migrate by the millions across the African plains and an entire herd will take off at the slightest hint of danger they run wildly for a short time and then they stop they forget why they were running in the first place. Sound a little like sheep? Well, meanwhile, um, lions who were very good learners, they simply follow that stampeding herd and then keep a leisurely pace waiting for them to stop. And when the wildebeest forget why they are running, it's dinner time for the lions. And their guide said that the wildebeest are so memory challenged that they will even walk up to a sleeping lion and start sniffing at it. The lion wakes up and has breakfast in bed. I mean, think about those poor things. Imagine running and running and then forget why you're running in the first place. Sound a little familiar? Come to think of it, it may have happened to you before. How many times have you gone into another room, as have I, and said, rats? and you can't remember what you went in to get. You know, do we do that because we are in too much of a hurry? 
or we have too much on our minds. I certainly hope we're not as forgetful as the wildebeest. But my theory is it's more likely we are not first making a conscious decision of what we need, you know, really putting it on our minds before we're already moving and walking into the other room. In other words, we are distracted by other things, and so we forget. Well, today's gospel invites us to end the confusion and to be thinking all the time about what we have before we go looking for something we want. It starts with uh, Jesus meeting a man in the crowd who wants Jesus' help. His father had died, and apparently he is a younger brother because his older brother was now taking the portion of inheritance, and the younger uh, brother thinks that the amount is unfair. When a father died, Jewish law said that the oldest brother would get two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger brother would get just one-third. And so when the man is asking Jesus to come and judge the situation, what he's really asking or wanting from Jesus is for Jesus to judge in his favor and give him a greater share of what is left. And yet Jesus said, no, who am I to be your judge? And instead he tells a story for the whole crowd to learn from. He describes a successful man uh, clearly a wealthy man who is focused more on accumulating even more wealth than he needs and then holding on to it. The successful man has so many crops, in fact, that he's run out of space for his abundance and he has to build even bigger silos to contain them. It reminded me so much of the uh, storage unit industry, which is huge in the U.S., um, as well as some other countries, too, where there's a lot of wealth. Uh, one in three Americans are currently renting a storage unit for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's not all to hold stuff we don't need, um, but it is the American way. When our houses get too full, our garages or our barns, what do we tend to do? A lot of us rent a storage unit, and we pay money to hold all that stuff rather than downsize the items down to their essentials. Too much stuff? Well, that's what the farmer did. The farmer thinks to himself, hey, I'll just build bigger barns. And then I can relax and eat and drink and be merry for lots of years. But in the parable, God calls him foolish and says, hmm, you don't know it, but this could be your last day on earth. Then whose crops will these be? And God warns the man against storing treasures rather than being rich toward God. It's a big shift in thinking. In other words, think about what having all that extra stuff will do to your soul. God's warning really does go against the old saying, doesn't it? The person with the most toys wins. Well, not in God's eyes. There was a reporter who asked um, John D. Rockefeller one time. Um, he said, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money does a man need to be happy? And he said, always just a little bit more than he has. Think about that. It's a very famous quote, and there is a whole lot of truth in it. Rockefeller today would have an estimated net worth of around $418 billion, even adjusted for inflation. And still, it's not enough. We always want more, according even to Rockefeller. Well, Jesus did not feel sorry for the rich man because his barns were full. He felt sorry for him because his soul was empty. His parable urges us to make conscious decisions every day to put God over our stuff, God over money and the things that it buys. In my first year of seminary, I had a roommate who um, I think she was repeating what her parents had taught her growing up. And keep in mind that her parents had been missionaries for a number of years 
and she herself had lived some years in a very poor country. I don't remember which country it was. Uh, but we would be out shopping, and every single time when I would hold something up, I'm ready to put it in my cart, she'd kind of nudge me or stop me, and she'd say, but do we really need this? Ugh! She even said, we. Oui. And I would have to say, um, she really got under my skin. I mean, mostly because I felt she's judging me, which she was. And I also didn't remember asking her for any advice. But I'll tell you, I was really irritated and it stuck with me because she was right. It was the perfect question to be asking myself. She was right. I did not need the item. I just wanted it. And her question made me stop and think. Were those where were those desires going to take me? To more desires. When you think of each item you're putting in that cart, where were those desires going to take me? And it truly was to even more desires as the richest man in the world had said a number of years ago. In other words, Rockefeller. Wanting more inevitably leads to wanting more even if you want more stuff for your kids or your grandkids, and it might be a really good feeling that you're left with. More really does lead to wanting more. So her interruption actually made me start thinking about all of my choices. And when I looked at my things, it'd be like, you know, it's only a few more dollars, but what better uses do I have for even that small of an amount? And was this helping me to grow or expand as a human being? Or was the purchase leading me to desire trying to keep up with the Joneses? Ironically, it's also the same question that's asked by organizers of homes and offices today. You know, they're the clutter specialists. They ask that of their clients. Do you really need another stapler or iron or hammer, or container, or tool, or book, or set of paper cups? Or is your barn so full that you can no longer find the ones that you have? There's probably a replica out there somewhere in the garage now with all kinds of stuff piled on top. I'm not trying to guilt you in any way here over the last time you may have cleaned out your garage, or how you use your money even. The latest power, mega Powerball ticket? A lot of people buying those right now. But I can tell you that today's parable asks us each to stop and consciously make our decisions carefully. Because our decisions about our treasures, our things, our money, affect our very souls. It has to do with our attitude. Jesus' parable here is also not to guilt people who are in genuine need. But many Americans and those folks in the wealthier countries are so comfortable with the abundance, with the affluence, that we don't even bother to think about it anymore until perhaps we no longer have what we need. Something in our life that's very dramatic changes and we go into crisis. Jesus told the parables that he did because he was a wise man rather than foolish. He was on a mission to change people's lives for the better by getting them to stop and very often in those parables to think, especially for those who were wealthy to think. And he often reminded people of what's valuable long-term, long-term, not what is popular or trendy or what feels good right now, but has a cost in the future. He was more concerned about our souls, our ability to look beyond ourselves while we're on earth and to what happens after death. Again and again, he gave us directions on how we can find a long lasting new life through his death on the cross and our faith in him. We can have new life that will last forever, everlasting life through his resurrection. Now, sometimes his teachings and his parables 
really can get under our skins, just like my friend who kept asking, but do we really need this? Jesus' words are often serving like medicine for our own good, even if it tastes bad when we take it, because it's for our own good. He is helping us to become better people and better Christians. Now compare the Rockefeller comment about wanting more to this woman. Think all the way back to the year 400 or so, and St. Jerome uh, was mentioned, mentioned in a letter that he knew this woman who preferred to store her money in the stomachs of the needy than in her purse. You got that? She preferred to store her money in the stomachs of the needy than in her purse. Wise words. Wanting more is not a new concept. It's been around forever. Not just in the year 400 or Jesus day, but long before that. You know, I don't think we want to be like Rockefeller, always needing more. I don't think we want to be like those poor wildebeests, running, 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 and then forgetting what we are running after. Wanting more, leading to wanting more. Today, Jesus taught us that we should stop. Thank God for everything that we have, share God's generosity with others, and consider even the smallest decisions that we make because it, each decision impacts our soul. It is the fool that says, ah, heaven, it can always wait. And it is the fool who builds barns but postpones life. As disciples of Christ, our choice should always be to seek new life through Jesus Christ. Amen.